I want to begin with a quote from Jesus. I feel like on Resurrection Sunday, that's probably a great thing to do, okay? Quote from Jesus, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. You ready for this? Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. That's who we're worshiping this morning. That's who we're talking about. Not just a man, but a God man. Not just someone who died, but someone who died and conquered sin and death for all eternity and rose back from the dead. It reminds me of a story I read about. There was a man uh, who went to the Holy Land, went to Israel uh, with his wife and also his mother-in-law. The only reason they brought the mother-in-law is because she was paying for the whole thing and they really wanted to see Jerusalem and, and see the whole thing. Some of you are like, yeah, I know that story. Um, so they're in the Holy Land, and it was a little rough. You know, when mother -in -law, as mother-in-laws go, this, she was a tough, tough one. And so they're going around, and something tremendous or terrible, depending on how you look, on it, look at it, happened. Uh, five days into the trip, she has a heart attack and dies. And so they're like, what do we do? So they're talking to uh, some of the authorities in Jerusalem, because that's where she died. And one of the authorities said, okay, you've got two options with the body. Number one, we can ship it back to the States for you for a proper burial, but it's going to cost $5,000. Or for only $250, we can bury her right here in Jerusalem. So you just decide. And so the, the husband's thinking about this, and he's just like, man, what do I do? What do I do? And he looks at the authority and says, you know what? I'm going to pay the $5,000. And the authority's like, are you? Did, did you hear me? I mean, he's Jewish, right? He's just like, are you, did you hear me? I said for 250 bucks, you can leave her right here. And, and the husband looked at this man. And he said, 2,000 years ago, there was a man who died in this very city. He was buried and three days later came back from the dead. I cannot take that risk. <laughs> The heart of Christianity is that there was a man who died who didn't stay dead. He was buried, but he left the tomb empty. He walked right out of that grave. Now, when you think about the resurrection, you have to understand this is the moment where Christianity was created. You know, if you ask almost anyone in the world, like, what's the heart piece? What's the very center of Christianity? Most people would say the cross. But after the cross, Christianity didn't exist. After the cross, all of Jesus' followers and disciples ran away. They were hiding, locked themselves in a room because they were scared that they were going to get killed just like their teacher, Jesus. It wasn't till the day of resurrection. It wasn't till early Sunday morning on Easter when everything changed. It wasn't till Easter morning when those disciples who were terrified and hiding were emboldened to the point that they would actually give their life. But they weren't giving their life for a dead guy. That's what a lot of people in the world are doing. They're giving their lives for a dead guy that had some interesting things to say. We're giving our lives for a risen guy. We're giving our lives for, for a living savior who is no longer dead. That was the moment when Christianity was born. You know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, usually on Easter Sunday, preachers will, also, will always give this illustration. It's really cliche and I hate to do it, but it hit me a new way. It hit me in a new way. This, this Easter. And you know, they'll say, history itself, your very existence, though even the way that we tell time is all based upon Jesus, which is true, right? BC, before Christ, AD, mean in the year of our Lord in Latin. Now, what hit me was the year of our Lord, we can only say that because Jesus isn't dead anymore. The way that they would tell time was in the year of the king, like in Isaiah 6, in the year of the king Uzziah. I had this vision. But once that king died and a new king came, it was in the year of the next king. We've been saying in the year of the same king for 2,000 years now. Why? Because he's not dead. He's alive and he's still king and he's still reigning. Your birth date is based upon Christ's resurrection in the year of our Lord, the one who is alive. Here's something I want to do right now. I'm going to read the Easter story. I'm going to ask you all to stand. I'm not going to read a real long version of it, but let's just stand as we just kind of look at this together. If you guys don't mean, go ahead and stand right now. You'll see it up on the screens. This is from Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. 
says this, but very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Isn't it interesting how in the midst of hardship and sorrow, we forget the things that God has told us and shown us? Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Only the women got it at first. I love that. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. You guys can take a seat. Thanks for standing for the word. The story goes on. Jesus appeared to many, to his disciples. And we'll find out a little bit as we look at some of the things that Paul wrote about the resurrection, that he appeared to hundreds of people after he rose from the grave. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at Paul's account. In in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks almost like the entire chapter about the resurrection of Jesus, and he says some pretty significant things. One of the things that he does is as we look at this chapter, he tells us who Jesus is, but he also tells us who we are in, in, in relation to Jesus. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 3. It'll come up on the screen so you can, you can read along there. Paul says this, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. Some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Paul's giving some historical evidence for the, for the reality of the resurrection. He's saying, look, this wasn't just like a dream. He said literally hundreds of people saw him. It wasn't a hallucination because 500 people saw him at the same time. And he says, look, most of these people are still alive. If you don't believe me, just go talk to him. And then talk to another one and talk to another one and talk to another one and talk to another one. It's just historical evidence, this historical fact that there was this guy, Jesus. He died, but then people saw him come back to life after having died. Now, who is this Jesus? Paul begins by saying Jesus is the one who died for our sins. Paul will say it like this in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. He says, when we were utterly helpless, and by helpless he means we had all sinned. We had broken relationship with God. We had done things our way, not his way. Most of us had rebelled against God. We're just like, I don't want anything to do with you. And he's saying that's the state every single one of us find ourselves in from birth. He says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet still sinners. It's amazing. You got to understand, you were never created to experience hell. You were never created to experience death. You were never created to experience loss. That all came about from our sin. You were created to be in perfect relationship with the perfect God who perfectly loves you. But we messed it up. All of us, every single one of us have messed that up. Do you know who you're sitting next to right now? You're sitting next to one of the greatest sinners who've ever walked this planet. It's true. You're going to see him in a whole different light. You're like, I married this person. I know. Tell me about it. (laughs) And you're sitting next to the very person that God sent Christ to come and die for. Not because they were good. 
not because they deserved it, not because they were lovable. They weren't. Jesus just said, I want him, and I want her, and I want him, and I want her. And he came while we were all in this state of being fantastic at causing harm to ourselves and others and sinning against a good God. And that's what Paul says. He says, look, I pass on to you what was most important. What's most important? Jesus died for you because you separated yourself from God by your sin. I separated myself from God by my sin. So Jesus said, I can fix that because none of us could. He goes on and he says, not only did he die for our sins, but he was buried. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. Why did he have to put that in there? Like, why can you say he just died and then he rose again? He said, no, no, he was buried. Part of the reason, I think, is Paul wants us to know, look, this wasn't a trick, this wasn't a hoax, he really died. Like, I always wonder, like, okay, Jesus, like, you're on the cross, you breathe your last breath, you give up your spirit, is what the gospel say, you died. Like, how come you couldn't just wait, like, I don't know, 30 seconds, and then come back to life and be like, I did it, I'm back, you know? And I think part of it is some maybe would not believe that he had actually died. In the infamous words of Miracle Max from The Princess Bride, he says, there's a big difference between being mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is still slightly alive. With all dead, well, with all dead, there's usually only one thing you can do. Anybody know what it is? Go through his clothes and look for loose change. He says he died and he was buried. Why? Because he wasn't mostly dead. Those rumors were spread from the very moment Jesus was crucified. No, 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 he didn't really die. They just buried him, but he was still alive. And in the coolness of the tomb, he came back. Do you know how ridiculous that is? Do you think you could survive a a Roman flogging and a crucifixion and having somebody stab a spear into your heart and still live? No one with any two cents would ever believe that. He's like, he was buried, but, he said, he was also raised from the dead. Now, why is it important that he was raised from the dead? This really, I I had to struggle through this for years. I was like, okay, I get it, the whole dying part, forgiveness of sins, but why is it important that he actually was risen from the dead? Paul says, if, if Christ was not risen from the dead, you and I are still stuck in our sins, meaning we're still destined for hell if Christ didn't actually rise from the dead. When he rose from the dead, there's a couple things that he accomplished for us. One, I've said a couple times already, but it's this, that he defeated death and sin. He said, you don't have power over the human race anymore. I beat you. I won. Paul, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, says it like this in verse 55. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? This is Paul quoting from the Old Testament, mocking death, mocking sin. He said, for sin is the, is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus rose from the gra- grave, he defeated death and sin. Because we, if we receive him, are now in Christ, that means sin and death don't get to win over your life anymore. That you actually get to walk in victory over sin, and you get to walk in victory over death. But that's not the only reason that he had to be risen from the grave. When he rose from the grave, it also proved that what he claimed to do on the cross, he really accomplished. Think about it. Jesus walked this earth and he said, hey, I can forgive sins. Now, some of you are like, okay, big deal. No, no, think about it. He was claiming that he could rescue you from hell and make sure, guarantee that you had heaven as your eternal destination after you die. That's what he was saying. And the Pharisees, the the Jewish religious guys at the time, they're like, nobody can forgive sin but God. And Jesus is like, you're catching on. (laughs) He claimed he could forgive sins. What if Jesus made that claim but really couldn't do it? What position would you and I be in? Jesus also claimed that he could give us life. That When we die, it's not the end. It's really just the beginning of eternal life. Jesus claimed that he is the only way to have a real relationship with God. What if that was a false claim? What if we've missed this whole thing? It's the resurrection that proves every single one of those claims true. 
Jesus, over six times in the gospel, predicted that he'd be arrested, he'd be crucified, but that he would rise three days later. If a guy can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, I'm going with him. <laughs> when he predicted that and accomplished it, it verified every other claim and promise that he made. He promised you salvation. Guess what? He proved it in the resurrection. He, he promised you new life now. He promised you joy and peace now. He proved it in the resurrection. This is why Paul says, I'm telling you the most important things. He died, he, bar- he was buried, but he rose again from the dead. Paul's saying this is who Jesus is. But he goes on and he, he begins to describe himself. And in describing himself, he says, this is who all of us are. I mean, these are two important questions for us to answer in our life. Who is Jesus and who am I in relationship to him? Look at verse eight. He says, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Remember, he's saying Jesus presented himself to 500 and then to Peter and then the other 12 and the other apostles. And he goes, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. If you guys have read Paul's story, he used to go by a different name, Saul. And he was going around all of Judea, arresting as many Christians as he could and killing as many as he could. He was, he was what we would consider like modern day ISIS, the Taliban. This is, what he, this is who he was. And he said, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. And not without results, for I've worked harder than any of the other apostles. A little brag in there, Paul, okay. (laughs) Yet, it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. Paul's saying, who am I? He says, I'm a target of God's grace. When you think about that question, who am I in relationship to Jesus? The first answer that needs to come to mind is, I'm a target for Jesus' grace. There's, There's no one here who has sinned in a more powerful way than the power of God's grace. It it reminds me of a true story. I read about a woman who locked her keys in her car in a rough neighborhood, and she had someone come by to help her, and is like, I don't know how to do this, but I do have a coat hanger. So she grabbed a coat hanger from one of the, the houses nearby, and she's trying to put it in there and trying to unlock her car, but she's not getting anywhere. It's starting to get dark. It's not the place you want to be after dark. She's getting nervous. So she finally prays, God, you got to help. You got to send me someone who can unlock this car for me. I guess she didn't have AAA. So she notices an old beat up car pull up right behind her. And she's like, oh no. And this man gets out, rough looking guy, skull cap on his head, tats everywhere, you know, real big guy. And she's like, oh my goodness, who is this guy? And the guy comes up and he says, can I help you? And the lady's like, gosh, Lord, this is the guy you're sending me? Are you kidding me? Man asked, can I help? And she said, can you break into my car? (laughs) He said, not a problem. Took the coat hanger, opened the car in a few seconds. And she looked at him afterwards and said, you are such a nice man. And he stopped in his tracks. He was taken back. He said, no, I'm not. He says, you you don't know me. You don't know what I've done. I actually just got out of prison three hours ago. I've been in there for the last five years for Grand Theft Auto, and that's just what they caught me for. (laughs) I'm not who you think I am. I am not a nice man. As he's saying this, she wraps her arms around him, hugs him, and begins shouting, thank you, God, for sending me a professional. You have to understand, sometimes we view ourselves one way and God views us completely differently. Sometimes all we see is what we've done and what God sees is what Christ did for you. We look at our sin, God looks at the cross. We look at our past, God looks at our future and says, this is who you could be if you'll give your life to me. You have to understand, you cannot out God's grace. You're just not that good at sinning. I know you're pretty good, and you're a professional at it, but you're not that good. God's grace is so much stronger than any sin we could possibly commit. Now, as we speak about the resurrection, 
It tells us who Jesus is, what he's done for us. It tells us who we are. We are targets of his grace. There's no one that's outside of the realm of the possibility of being touched by the, by the grace of Jesus Christ. But you have to understand, when we speak about the resurrection, it's not something that's meant to just be studied or viewed or just looked at. You know, sometimes we'll come to a message on, on Easter and it's like, let me give you the 27 reasons why the resurrection actually happened. We all go, wow, I'm convinced. That's really cool. What a great study. And then we walk away. That's not what the resurrection is meant to be. The resurrection is not meant to be simply believed. It's not even meant to simply be celebrated. I mean, we're singing and shouting and dancing in here, but that's really not the whole point of the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is actually meant to be experienced today by each and every one of us. This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter three, verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. He's like, I don't wanna just believe in it. I don't wanna just view it from a distance. I don't wanna just believe that it's a historical fact. I wanna see it here and now in my life. He says, I wanna know Jesus. I wanna be in relationship with him. And Paul knows if I'm in relationship with the one who brings all dead things back to life, then it's illegal for me to not be experiencing that same resurrection power right now, today. He says, I want to experience the resurrection. It reminds me of a story in Luke chapter 24 in Luke's account of the resurrection. Jesus comes back to life and he begins pranking people. It's really great. I don't know if you've read the story, but you know, he walks through a wall and goes, I'm back guys, to all his disciples that are hiding. And the first thing he says is fear not. I mean, picture like you're sitting maybe at your desk at work and, and you can't see behind you and someone comes up behind you and says, don't be afraid. You're like, okay, Jesus. Like he's just paying the disciples back for three and a half years of dealing with them. But one of the other pranks he pulls is he, he begins walking with two other disciples, not the apostles, but two other disciples. And they're actually walking in the wrong direction. They're walking away from where he had told them to wait for him. And the reason they're walking away from where they told him to wait for him is because they saw him get crucified. And they're like, well, he must have been wrong. He must not have been who we thought he was. He must not have been the savior. He must not have been the Christ. He must not have been the Messiah. I guess we got this wrong. So he begins walking with them, but he looks different. He's kind of in disguise. They don't know it's Jesus. And so they're just walking along the road. And he's like, what's up, guys? You look a little sad. What's going on? And they essentially say, this is my translation of the Greek. They said, are you an idiot? Like, do you not know anything? There is this man, Jesus, a great prophet. Our religious leaders killed him, and now we're sad about it. We thought he was the one that was going to turn the world upside down and set all wrong things right, but I guess we were wrong. And Jesus, again, they don't know it's him, begins going, talking to him and saying, actually, you guys are the idiots. Again, my, my paraphrase. He says, you guys don't understand what's been written about the Messiah. And it says, beginning at the very beginning of scripture with Moses all the way through the prophets, Jesus has this Bible study with them and begins showing them every place in the Old Testament where it describes what would happen to himself, why it was necessary for the Messiah to die, to be buried, and to come back from the dead. Now we get to this point, sun's setting, and, and the two disciples are about to go home, and Jesus is like, I'm gonna keep walking. And they're like, what are you doing? It's dark, it's gonna get late, this isn't safe to walk out here, why don't you come and have dinner with us? And Jesus is like, all right. So they come, they sit down, and they begin to have a meal. And they're like, well, you know so much about the Bible. Why don't you pray for our meal? So Jesus grabs bread, looks up, blesses it, gives thanks for it, breaks it in the same way that he did with the miracle of the 5,000, the same way that he did on the night of, of the Last Supper when he's celebrating communion with his disciples, the, the way that they had seen him break it and bless it so many times before. And in that moment, it says their eyes are open and they recognize Jesus. And Jesus is like, I'm out and disappears. I'm just like, that's the best thing ever. I mean, he literally is having so much fun. And just think about it. Like if you went through crucifixion and now you're alive again, you're like, oh, okay, I'm feeling good again. I'm gonna have some fun now. Look at what they said. This is Luke 24, verse 32. After Jesus had left, disappeared, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? 
didn't our hearts burn within us? They were coming from a place of having a certain set of beliefs. Oh yeah, this, this teacher, Jesus, we think he's the one, we think he's the Messiah. Those beliefs got tested and failed. He's dead. He's in the tomb. Yeah, we heard some rumors that maybe he's out, but I haven't seen him. I think, I think it's all a hoax. I don't know what's going on. Jesus begins speaking to them and their hearts begin to burn inside. It's just like something is grabbing their spirits because the very author of life, life himself is speaking to them and their spirits are coming back to life. They're experiencing the resurrection in that moment. Not just believing it, that, it, that it's something that had happened. They're like, our hearts are burning. And they went from just having a set of beliefs to actually believing Jesus, believing that he is who he says he is, that he did what he said he would do. The question for us as we leave today is, what needs to be resurrected in your life? What do you actually need to begin believing God for? What's an area of your life where you need to not just view the resurrection from a distance as something that maybe happened, maybe didn't, or you're convinced it did happen, but what's an area of your life where you actually need to experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ today? That's why we're here. If we leave and just go, man, we sing some great Easter songs, we had some cupcakes, or I don't know what we're having out there, musubis, I think. Don't tell the kids, you guys got to get those before the kids come back. Side note. Yeah, just don't pick the kids up. No, please pick the kids up. Our our children's workers will riot if you don't. Like if all we came for here was just this fun celebration, you're getting gypped. You need to walk out of here with a target in mind. You need to walk out of here with a place in your life where you're like, no, it is time for me to be experiencing the resurrection life of Jesus here. All of us have these areas in our lives that feel a little bit dead and dying. Jesus doesn't want you to leave feeling the same way. For some of you, it's salvation. Like it's literally you are dead spiritually because you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to get right with him and not wait. You need to get right with him today. You need to experience that resurrection life the fact that he proved every single claim he made that he could save you, that he is the only way to have a relationship with God, that you were not destined for hell, you're destined for heaven and he's the only one who can get you there. You need to stake your whole existence, your whole being, any possibility of an afterlife, you gotta stake it on Jesus, you gotta do it today. That's where you need to experience resurrection life. Some of you, there's relationships in your life parent-child relationships, I feel like the Lord's saying in particular this morning for this service, that just feel very difficult and very dead. And you need to be praying, Lord, how am I going to experience resurrection life in that relationship? Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your health. It's like I've received Jesus, but my body is just a mess. Maybe it's mental health this morning. There's so many areas in our life, right? There's so many areas in our life where we just need the touch of Jesus. That's what resurrection's about. The most important thing, heaven, absolutely, like Paul said. But that doesn't negate all the other areas that Jesus wants to come in and bring life where there is death. Some of you have lost hope. You've begun to despair. That's not what you're created for. Jesus came, died, was buried, rose from the grave so that you could receive an inheritance. And part of that inheritance is joy every single day. You have to fight for it sometimes, but that's part of what resurrection brings. Joy, peace, a spirit of victory and overcoming. Where is it? Where is your target where you're inviting Jesus to come and bring resurrection where there's been death? I'm gonna ask the prayer team to start coming to the front. And I'm just gonna pray for us. And I just want us to give an op- just give us all an opportunity whatever that area is, just to invite Jesus to come in and do some saving. Again, for some of you, it might be receiving Jesus for the very first time. If that's you, I just want you to, in your own heart, say a very simple prayer after me. But you need to know what you're getting into. If you want Jesus to save you, he says, deal, I'll do it, but it's gonna cost you everything. If you come to Jesus for saving, if you come to Jesus for life, you have to give up your very life. 
You're not boss of your life anymore. Nothing you own is yours. It's all his. Every relationship, every thought, everything belongs to him because he's king. But he's a good king. He's a loving king. And he wants to completely change and transform your life. And if you want to give your life to Jesus, just in your own heart, I just want you to repeat after me and just say these words. Jesus, I quit. I'm done being in charge. I'm done doing life my way. You're in charge. And you're the only one who can save me. Come into my life right now. I give you as much as I know how to give right now, knowing that you're going to ask for more later. But as much as I know how to give, I give it all to you right now. Would you come and forgive me of my sin? And would you give me that same resurrection life that you promised? I just want to pray over the rest of us. There's another area where you're just like, I need to experience life. Let me just pray over us. Jesus, you're not dead. You're our living king. Everything you touch comes back to life. So would you come and touch those dead areas right now? Broken relationships, would those be mended in the name of Jesus? I feel especially from the Lord right now, there's someone who's just so embittered because of what's been done to you and because of certain people in your life. And it's brought so much death and decay to you, to your family, to the people around you. And Jesus, I just see a picture of him just extending a hand saying, there's a way out. It's me. He wants to help you and empower you to forgive the people you need to forgive. So Jesus, we speak against bitterness right now. And we ask that your resurrection life would touch that area, Lord. Father, I want to ask right now this morning that those that need physical healing, maybe it's sickness. I feel like the Lord's saying he's healing ulcers right now in particular. I feel the Lord also highlighting um, lower like intestinal issues for someone here this morning. Jesus, you promised us healing. And you actually commanded us to go pray for the sick and see them healed. So Lord, we're just asking for resurrection life to touch the bodies of the people here who are sick or injured that need healing. We thank you just for all that you do, for all that you've done. We thank you that you are good and that you are God and that you're in control. And we just stand in this place of receiving fresh resurrection life today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.